Hello, this is Monocomp. Monocomp is also monopolistic competition. And oligopoly. Ol oligopoly. But I'm mute, so round one of this didn't go real well. <laughs> so if you sense like an annoyance in my voice, it's due solely to my own incompetence. Okay, guys, so this is it. This is our last unit in uh, unit three, the long unit in micro. Monopolistic competition, a market structure characterized by a large number of sellers. Bars in Marshfield, 50, 60, right? Dozens and dozens. Um, little cafes in New York City, uh, dry cleaners in San Francisco, lots of them, small mom and pop businesses. Uh, differentiated products, there's unique tr uh, traits, unique products at Joe's Diner versus Mary. It's relatively easy entry and exit into the marketplace, low barriers to entry. That would be monopolistic company. Don't be confused by the graph. It looks just like Monopoly. Marginal revenue is downsloping. Demand is downsloping. It may be a little more elastic than we're used to in Monopoly, but it, it's really hard to tell. In fact, it looks pretty much the same. Uh, we're not at allocative efficiency. We're not at MC equals price equals demand. We're at MR equals MC. And then up to demand curve. And notice we're generally not at minimum ATC, as we'll talk about in a minute. We'll probably see that more clearly on the second graph. Um, economic profits, perhaps in the short run. Uh, you can have economic profitability or losses in the short run, depending on, on the industry, depending on the particular business. Um, if you have losses, well, you'd expect exit, just like we would in pure competition. If we have economic profit, we'd expect entry, just like we'll see here in a second. What are you sniffing, cat? Okay. So, monopolistic competition, long-run equilibrium. Here it is, guys. No economic profitability. You can see clearly that MR equals MC up to demand is yielding a normal profit as ATC is tangent at the point of price on demand curve. Uh, little cafes in New York City. Entry and exit. If Ma's Cafe is making a lot of money, Bill's pops up down the street, and we've got normal profitability in the long run. We're also not at minimum ATC. Um, these firms tend to advertise on a smaller scale, uh, newspapers, signs, maybe uh, maybe a local TV ad, um, and they product differentiate. We talked about Rainforest Cafe differentiating its product through animatronic and atmosphere. Um, neon signs, all these things go into making the price uh, slightly higher than it could be at minimum ATC. So these little uh, mom-and-pop businesses, uh, monopolistic competitors, do not produce an allocative nor productive efficiency. At the same time, there's some nice things that come from that. Uh, it's nice to know that a particular um, cafe is vegan. It's nice to know that, uh, you know, we don't, not so much anymore, but some places non-smoking. Or um, it's nice to go to El Cal or other restaurants and have a nice ambiance and atmosphere. Um, these are good things to know. Uh, buyer's Guide coupons. Hey, it's Fish Fry Friday night, and they have uh, a coupon for you. These kind of things um, help consumers find products that are more suitable to them. Hey, cat. Let's talk about market structures. You eat cat food, right? Do you eat cat food? Well, there's a few large cat food producers in the country. Right, Purina, for example. Uh, Meow Mix, I don't know what, I'm trying to think what company that is. But anyway, there are large cat food producers, right? Okay. They produce at a national level. They have massive distribution systems. They have brands that everybody recognizes, whether you're in Arkansas, Florida, Wisconsin, or California. This is Oligopoly, Ford, Chrysler, GM. Three large companies that, especially when I was a kid and a little bit earlier, dominated 80% of the American car market, 90% of the American car market. Uh, Coke and Pepsi. They probably have, between them, 
80% of the soft drink market in this country, right? Uh, maybe more. Large companies with high barriers to entry. Uh, billion dollar corporations with hundreds of millions spent on advertising. I'm not getting in that market. I'm not competing with General Motors. I'm not building that company. Although it's interesting when you look at some of the, the automakers that have jumped in um, with some devices such as Tesla and others. But but really, it's 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 an oligopoly. It's it's hugely expensive, and individuals aren't jumping in um, and starting a car company on a whim. Every one of these companies can set their own price, but there is some price interdependence because of the market. If you have three firms that sell cars in the United States, you want the prices to be in the ballpark. You don't want to be too far outside the market price, or we can run into issues like we'll see on our graph. In an oligopoly, um, the strength of the oligopoly can be limited by trade and international competition. Certainly the strength of the oligopoly, the American Auto Big Three, um, is much less today with competition from Germany, from Volkswagen, Mercedes, competition from Japan, from Toyota, uh, from Honda, from Nissan. So, so really, it's still an oligopoly. You've got 10 firms that probably have 98% of the uh, new car market in the United States. Um, but the concentration has been weakened to a certain extent. referring to is the Herfindahl Index. The Herfindahl Index, it, simple definition, is the sum of the squared percentage market shares for all firms in the industry. Um, so taking oligopoly, for example, we take the largest firm and we square its market share. So let's say let's say Coke is 60% of the soft drink market in the United States, okay? Uh, that, that might be. Let's say they have 40%. Okay, 40 squared. Big number, 1600. And Pepsi that's got 30%, 30 squared, so forth, right? Think about the number that you end up with there versus pure competition. Uh pure let's take a pure competition market. Um the biggest corn farm in the United States has what percent of the market share? It's less than one, probably less than a tenth, probably you know less than a hundredth of a share. <laughs> really small numbers, close to zero. Uh, think of Monopoly. Monopoly is 100% squared, right? 10,000 is the largest Herfindahl number you can get. Ah, the best graph in econ, the kink graph of the oligopoly. So how does this work? Well, I, I don't like the giant gap they have there that shows this huge um, huge break in marginal revenue curves that should be smaller. There aren't two MC curves. There's one MC curve. What they're saying is that that MC curve can fluctuate over a range and everyone's going to still want to price at the kink. Why? Well, that's kind of the market price. Um, as long as everybody's pretty much at the kink, uh, they're not competing on price. If Ford is, like we talked about in class, the Ford truck is 24000 the GM is... 23.5 and the Chrysler's 24 or the the Dodge is 24.4. It's all right in that ballpark, right? They're going and you're going to want to compete on brand loyalty. If you go over that kink substantially, the demand curve becomes very elastic. People substitute competitors for your product. Um, if you go below it, you can set off a price war. In the short run, that might be beneficial. In the long run, it's problematic. talk about this year is price theory, game theory. And the notion that your actions can influence others and there's interdependent in pricing. There's no interdependence in pricing in monopolistic competition. Too many firms, you can't possibly collaborate with 40 or 50 or 60 different companies. With three or five, yeah, you can. Here's a classic example of a game theory matrix. Rare Air and Uptown. If Rare and Air Uptown work together, they work together to set their price and function like a monopoly, they'd each make $12 per ticket, okay? That sounds great. But if one of them tried to undercut the other, as you can see, they would make a profit of 15. The best, at least in the short run, is trying to undercut your competitor. However, ultimately, what tends to happen is both of these firms gravitate towards the least desirable solution. Um, in the price war, if you're competing, you end up with D. It would be better here, in this scenario, 
um, for the two firms to work together. They would function as a monopoly. Colluding as a monopoly, the firms would split the profits, and you'd make economic profits, and then they would be split by market share, uh, 45 or 30 percent of the market, whatever, or if, if there were only two in a duopoly, um, if one had 60 and one had 40, you'd split the profits in that particular manner. Um, collusion, overt collusion is illegal. Um, so what you'd want to do is not compete on price and just uh, try to roll along and not get involved in those price wars. Although, as we've talked about in class, as we did with our uh, analysis of Walmart and the holiday price wars, um, that's not always, not always how business is going to operate. Oligopoly. Price has been not equal to minimum ATC. Not an oligopoly. Allocated efficiency. Price equals marginal cost. No, nope, not an oligopoly. No firm achieves productive or allocative efficiency except pure competition. And there it is, guys. We have completed. Hey, Kat, what'd you think about me using the uh, the Meow Mix example? Was that a good good choice? The cat's not talking now. But she's affirming with her blinks of the eye that I made a good example. Right, kitty? All right. Hope you enjoyed this chapter. Talk to you later. Bye.